Welcome back to Rafford Reading Daily. We are continuing to read Hinterland, America's New Landscape of Class and Conflict by Phil A. Neal. We are on Chapter 2, which is entitled Silver and Ash. And we are on a segment within Chapter 2, which is entitled Hidden Temples. I want to ask people to please share this link on a social media platform, whichever one you frequent most often, or text message it to somebody, send it in a group chat. Uh, send it in a Facebook group, whatever it is that you can do to put this link out there. We want to ask you to do that. We want to remind everybody that we put these episodes out on SoundCloud, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Pocket Cast, Anchor, YouTube, Facebook, anywhere audio is available. We are releasing these podcast episodes. I think we still got to get caught up on Facebook and YouTube, so we're a little bit back. But hopefully by the time this comes out, we're closer to being caught up. And on the previous episode of Rockford Reading Daily, as we began chapter we began chapter 2 of hinterland silver and ash we learned about the the extensive amount of fires that take place in some of these west coast rural areas we learned about some of the resources that's put towards fighting those fires we learned about some of the divestment of of uh, or some of the negative impact that the economy in these places have felt over the last 30 to 40, 50 years with deindustrialization and with uh, changing of technology. We spoke about some of the damage that's been done to these rural areas because of these fires and because of, uh, of some of these companies and mining and uh, timber, all of those things and all of the effects that they've had to negatively impact the ecosystem of these rural areas. We also spoke about the role that crystal meth plays in some of these areas. And we spoke about some of the connections between uh, crystal meth addiction and opiate addiction and uh, crystal meth opiate, opiate use in rural West coast cities and States and the connection between uh, heroin addiction and crack cocaine addiction and heroin use, crack cocaine use in urban areas. And again, as we kept, as we continue to read further, we continue to see, of course, vast differences in rural life and urban life in America. But we also continue to see similarities between rural life and urban life in America. And I think one of the things that's important for us to do here at the May 30th Alliance is to be able to bridge those gaps uh, to remind us that collectivism is the only way to properly combat capitalism and that even though we may have struggles that appear different on the surface level or at first look, that they have that they very much have interconnectedness uh, between them. We also read about how prisoners are used to fight fires in California, how they uh, mostly low level felons, but 30 to 40 percent of the wildland fighters in California are prisoners. They get two dollars a day and two dollars an hour when they're actively fighting these fires on the line. Uh, and again, that's just another form of of. Of labor. I don't know what the right word would be, but labor abuse or some shit, something like that. I guess maybe that'd be the right terminology. But again, it's just a reminder of how mass incarceration can slip into these issues that you think may be very far removed from mass incarceration. Okay, let's hop into the next section entitled Hidden Temples. Traveling along the Klamath, you get a sense of everything slowly turning upside down. The river is born in the lava-scorched plains of southern Oregon, where irrigated flatlands are intercut with volcanic ridgelines marking the eon-slow movement of stratovolcanoes across the landscape. As it rolls westward, the placid, pesticide-polluted river cuts into the slowly uplifting Klamath Mountains, where the water is filtered through the maze-like channels of granite and diorite until the downstream rapids grow clearer than those of the watershed, a river turned upside down. Population decreases and the arid, volcanic landscape gives way to a labyrinthine geology in which relatively young sedimentary deposits might be intercut with ancient, subducted metamorphic rocks and outcropping of black and rust red, period, period tight ejected from the dark blood churn of the mantle far below. Even the strata must often be read in reverse. 
the oldest layers twisted by tectonics until they sit above or astride younger ones. And atop everything teems a stunning chaos of flora and fauna, sunk tooth and root into the landscape. Plant life fails to follow the orderly altitude models seen in other mountainous regions. This and many other curiosities have led scientists to think of the area not so much as a single ecosystem, but as a, quote, not, end quote, where many landscapes have been tied together, piled upside down, one on top of the other, their origins occulted. It's also here that white, rural America begins to be turned on its head. Many parts of the far hinterland are as cosmopolitan as any city and always have been. Rural diversity is simply more dispersed and more segregated. There are hints of this buried in all the mountain towns of the West. Weaverville, located just off the Trinity River, houses one of the last remaining Taoist temples in the region and one of the oldest Chinese temples in California. The Weaverville Joss House, named the temple among the trees and beneath the clouds in Chinese, was built in 1874 to replace an even earlier temple that had burned down. Today it houses numerous mining artifacts used by Chinese immigrant workers and antique weapons from the Tong Wars, a period of intern, internecine conflict and defensive violence within U.S. Chinese settlements, centered on San Francisco's Chinatown and coinciding roughly with the stretch of economic depression and rising anti-Chinese sentiment. Such temples, often the center of vibrant, lowing wave upon wave of mass deportations, often carried out by nativist mobs, the Chinatowns were gradually demolished. Oh, I, I, I fucked that sentence up. Excuse me, let me try this one more time. Such temples, often the center of vibrant Chinatowns, once dotted the landscape of the Far West. But following wave upon wave of mass deportations, often carried out by nativist mobs, the Chinatowns were gradually demolished. Today is still common for people excavating old plots to find the remnants of foundations and hidden tunnels built by the Chinese, some say for smuggling, others say for escaping anti-Chinese programs. Pogroms. Excuse me. Farther down the Klamath and the Trinity lie California's largest reservations, the Hoopa and the Uruk, with the patchwork of smaller tribal lands and use rights given to the Carrick and Klamath as well. Such spaces offer a glimpse of maybe the most systematically ignored segment of the American underclass. Some of the highest shares of poverty in the U.S. are found not in the, quote, inner city, end quote, but instead within rural counties with predominantly black, Hispanic, and indigenous populations, as well as in the poorest parts of white Appalachia. According to the five-year American Community Survey for 2015, the 10 counties with the highest share of population in poverty were all, quote, majority minority, end quote, rural counties located in places such as the predominantly black Mississippi Delta, the largely Hispanic Texas borderlands, or the areas around reservations such as Pine Ridge in South Dakota. After these come the historically poor Appalachian counties, and then the urban ones. Comparing urban to rural shares of poverty by race, rural areas come out on top of every category. As measured by the census's admittedly archaic race and ethnicity categories, though the poverty rate for black urbanites already sits at 26%, averaged across all urban counties, the same rate for black ruralities rises to 36.9%. American Indians see the next highest shares at 25.4% urban and 33% rural. The same pattern exists for the Hispanic population, with 23.9% in poverty in urban areas and 27.5% in rural. But this number is suspiciously low, likely due to the fact that the census often provides slightly less accurate population data in some rural areas due to the large influx of undocumented immigrants working on farms, mines, pipelines, or the new oil fields in places like North Dakota. Though such immigrants compose only 4.8% of the total rural population, they are predominantly concentrated in the Southwest in a handful, and in a handful of rural counties in the Pacific Northwest and the South. In Washington and Oregon, many of the counties with the highest shares of foreign-born people are in rural... Let me try, to, try that one more time. Sorry about that. In Washington and Oregon, 
many of the counties with the highest shares of foreign-born people are in rural, farming-dependent parts of the state. The same is becoming true for places like Georgia and North Carolina, as more restrictive immigration laws push migrants to new destinations in the South to work in agriculture, food processing, or manufacturing. These are low-paying jobs with unrest met by threats of deportation. One of the few studies of poverty among immigrants in rural areas found that poverty rate for rural, non-citizen immigrants sat at 31.6% compared to 13.7% in urban areas. While other groups' poverty rates skyrocket due to un- and underemployment, 15.6% of rural immigrants tend to be in poverty even when working full-time, compared to 8% for native-born ruralities. These populations often disappear in images of rural America due to a combination of geography, segregation, and low population density. Despite the historical diversity of the countryside and its rapid rate of change, whites remained a disproportionate majority at 77.8% of all rural population in 2010, compared to a national share of 63.7% in that same year. Historically, rural areas segregated at the same rate as urban ones, a phenomenon especially strong in the South. And contemporary patterns of rural segregation have continued to roughly match their urban counterparts, with the black population experiencing the highest levels of segregation between 1990 and 2000. After 2000, there is evidence that Hispanic segregation rates in, quote, new destinations, end quote, such as the South and Pacific Northwest, grew even more rapidly, though the rate varies substantially with local economic conditions. Overall, this segregation ensures that substantial segments of the far hinterland remain largely white spaces, and it is these areas that tend to dominate popular perception of rural life. Geographically, the dominance is uneven. Whites compose the vast majority, more than 90%, of the share of total rural population in the northeastern Rust Belt, the Midwest, and much of the Corn Belt. Many mountains and Pacific Many mountain and Pacific Northwest states see this number drop to 70 or 80 percent, but the concentration of the minority population in a handful of farming counties or hard-to-reach tribal lands still guarantees that much of the countryside appears almost exclusively white at first glance. In the South, this appearance begins to falter. Much of the far hinterland cut into a patchwork of long segregated swamps, forests, and small towns. Here, the white rural population averages about 60%, ranging from higher shares in the Appalachian states to the lowest share in South Carolina at 56.5% white and 36.4% black. In the Southwest, such reversals become the norm. Rural California is only 54.4% white, Arizona is 57.5%, and Texas is 58.4%. The trend reaches its apex in New Mexico, where the rural population is only 38.6% white. And then that brings us to a changing of the theme within this chapter. So let's take a moment to reflect. So I'm starting to get a better feel for the presentation of this book by Phil A. Neal. He's done a good job of describing these hinterlands to us. He did a good job of describing these hinterlands, the hinterlands that were in China, uh, describing the hinterlands that are in the these areas that he's giving us information about, you know, whether describing the kind of people who live there, describing what it visually looks like, describing some of the the sounds and the smells and things like that. And it's sort of, it does a good job of transferring us into these areas, into these places and explaining to us uh, what it is that people love about these places. And then at the same time, explaining to us the changes that are going on in these places and the things that people uh, don't love about these places and the things that people want to see changed about these places and also giving a, giving us a reality of these places. And so that this first chapter sort of started off with him describing this mountain to us and describing the landscape to us. And then we shifted to learning about some of the Chinese temples and some of the Chinatowns and some of the history that uh, people of Chinese descent have had with this area, these hinterlands in America. And I think that probably out of all the things that we've read, that's probably the first time that we've had 
we've read anything in this podcast series that did went into more in depth about the Chinese experience in America. I found that very interesting and uh, was given information that I didn't know. I also found the statistics that he gave us for poverty in rural areas to be very enlightening and eye opening. And I I think that maybe if I was to be asked before I had read these passages where I thought more poverty was concentrated in rural or urban areas, I probably would, would say rural areas. I don't know if I would have had the percentage being as wide as it actually ended up being. It was about a 10% difference for black people, more than about 10% difference for black people. Uh, though the poverty rate for black urbanites already sits at 26% averaged across all urban counties. The same rate for black ruralities rises to 36.9%. American Indians see the next highest shares at 25.4% urban and 33% rural. And then this uh, information about the Hispanic population with 23.9% poverty in urban areas and 27.5% poverty in rural areas, I thought was also very enlightening uh, because of what he, uh, the information he put next about it's hard to get a real grasp on these numbers because of less accurate population data with uh, immigrants working on farms, mines and pipelines and things of that nature. And so I thought all of those were, were very interesting and it adds a, another dynamic to these issues that we're, we're speaking about of racial injustice specifically. I think that a lot of times when we've talked and I've talked, it has been about racial injustice in the sphere of urban America. And I think that this book has done a good job of of making sure that I remember to expand that out to not just urban areas, but also rural areas and to make sure to understand what it is specifically that uh, people in these rural areas are combating. And I also found the racial demographic to be very interesting in the Rust Belt, in the Midwest, uh, the Corn Belt, they said that the population of whites compared to anybody else was disproportionately overwhelming 90 percent of whites in those areas whereas once you move to the south and you move to the southwest those numbers begin to drastically change until you get to new mexico where the population is down to 38.6 percent white and i think all of those things are uh, important pieces of information to hold on to because it just lets you know that Yes, you have to, and that's why I always say that you have to understand what it is that you're facing locally first. And then once you can understand those things, you can expand it out to statewide or region-wide and uh, nationally and then globally, because even though that they are, we do, we are all, we have more in common than we have differences, than we have different. If you don't know the differences, it's really hard for you to understand how to articulate the things we have in common. A lot of times the things that we have in common are beneath the surfaces of our differences. Okay, let's move on to the next segment, which is entitled Currencies. In 1964, severe floods tore trees from the shores of the Klamath and sent the timber crashing through the downriver bridges as landslides washed away stretches of highway. Overnight, the entire region was transformed into an archipelago of isolated islands, accessible only by air and sea. People still speak proudly of the floods today as an exhibit of the area's supposed self-reliance. And much of the region remains loosely connected to the global infrastructure of modern states and supply chains. For years, the entirety of the Internet in coastal Humboldt County ran through a single cord stretched southward to the Bay Area via Highway 101. When severed by landslides, road crews, or oblivious farmers, tens of thousands would lose Internet access, landlines would be inoperable, and credit cards would become useless sheaves of plastic and the bottlenecks were not exclusively virtual. Before 101 was straightened in Southern Humboldt, the quote, Redwood Curtain, end quote, even ensured that goods trucked into coastal range would have to be transferred to smaller vehicles capable of navigating the narrow highways, creating local inflation bubbles in the price of gas and staple foodstuffs. In its own strange way, this bottleneck acted as a sort of physical trade tariff, creating greater price creating greater price parity for producers who were behind the, quote, redwood curtain, end quote, and increasing demand for their products. 
traveling even farther inland from the, quote, lost coast, end quote, into the heart of the Klamis, the otherwise pervasive totality of states and markets appears upended, everything given over to a sort of casual anarchy. A friend who used to truck furniture from the coast to the Hooper Reservation had to navigate not by address, but by kinship networks and word of mouth. And even then, the final destination of any good was often unreachable, located beyond narrow trails or impassable roads. Meanwhile, government is devolved down to the bare skeleton of administration, tribal councils and cash payments allotted, allotted by quanta of blood. But real rural autonomy is an illusion. The state never just recedes. Wildland firefighters offer one image of his persistence, even the social arm of government tending to take a martial form in the outer orbits of power. But in the depths of California's, quote, Emerald Triangle, end quote, a more direct symbol of that city ensconed state, city ensconed, ensconced? I don't got my other phone next to me or else I would have looked a few of these words up. Uh, it's a bad habit. I should have the phone next to me. It's charging right now, though. Uh, so let, let's keep moving on. But in the depths of California's, quote, Emerald Triangle, end quote, a more direct symbol of that city in scone state becomes in the form of dark military helicopters that buzz like wasps through the snow-capped wilderness. Though most often conducting renaissance for ground crews, the helicopters would sometimes pitch and arc with the added weight of heavily armed mercenaries. At these times, you knew that the machines were bound somewhere, preparing to settle into alpine meadows where paramilitary soldiers would spill out across the warm summer fields to pull people from their houses at gunpoint, drag them across the wildflowers, and destroy their crops in front of their eyes. Many of the official economic statistics gathered in these areas are deceptive. When jobs evaporate, but people are still forced to buy food on the market and pay off taxes, rent, and their many debts, the economy is actually in a state of impartial collapse. In such conditions, black and gray markets emerge to fill the vacuum. The, quote, non-specialized, end quote, or government-dependent counties of the aspirational state of Jefferson are in reality dependent on a new, informal economic base. In part, this is composed of hobbled-together scams, diverse in their character and degree of illegality. The year I graduated high school, a friend of a friend in Eureka, California, was busted for running a virtual liquor store, stealing alcohol from his part-time job at the 76 near the freeway and selling it on MySpace. Over in Humboldt County, a roommate of mine worked several years for a local scrapping, hauling, and landscaping company run by an old libertarian who swore that Obama was a Kenyan socialist, hired mostly ex-cons, and paid everybody in locally minted silver coins. Every, money, every morning in Humboldt County, the docks were covered with people fishing or drawing in crab cages. In the mountains, venison and salmon acted as minor currencies. I often work clearing the forests around the property of local landowners, pay cash to oversee controlled burns in the hope that their houses might be marginally safer when the fires pass through. Hunting, fishing, odd jobs, and minor theft, these made up the employment profile of the region. Though the numbers remain hazy, the legal portion of the nationwide, quote, shadow economy, end quote, such as the under-the-table jobs listed above, had an output of around a trillion dollars in 2009, or about 8% of the U.S. GDP at the time. This legal shadow economy is rapidly growing, but the truly dominant industries in many of these areas were all illegal, at least under federal law. The numbers that are available for black and gray market commerce are clear as for marijuana, which has existed in the literal zone between local or partial legality and federal illegality for decades. Even prior to recreational legalization, the available data suggested that marijuana was the biggest crash cop, biggest crash crop in several states, including California, and likely one of the biggest cash crops in the country. In Northern California and Southern Oregon, we coexisted with local startups in meth and, later, opiates, which themselves composed the economic base of many rural counties where the climate, whether meteorological or political, is not well suited to large weed plantations. The black and gray shadow economy is not entirely drug related, however. In rural areas along the US-Mexico border, for example, smuggling constitutes a substantial employment base for local economies. 
And despite an entire genre of gothic, borderland narco journalism implying otherwise, most smuggling is in fact not drug trafficking, but rather the mundane, if illegal, concealed transport of consumer goods across the border to avoid customs payment. Whatever its composition, this shadow base is then accompanied by a bloating and induced demand within real estate and the service sector, where black market wages are laundered into the formal economy. Not all rural counties are primarily dependent on the shadow economy, though the informal sector does tend to comprise a larger share of their employment, on average. Overall, however, most regions still depend on just one or two industries. Out of all rural counties in the U.S., quote, non-specialized, end quote, compose the largest single share at 29.6% and are not distributed in any particular pattern. In general, however, the official economy of the hinterland is still far more dependent on goods producing industries such as farming, 19.8% of all counties, manufacturing, 17.8% of all counties, and mining, 9.3% of all counties. Government-dependent counties have overtaken mining-dependent ones at 12%, and recreation-dependent counties make up the second lowest share at 11.5%. Manufacturing in rural areas tends to be concentrated in the Northeast and Midwest, farming in the Plain States and Corn Belt, and mining in several clusters concentrated in Nevada, West Virginia, the Rocky Mountain states, and in the oil fields of Texas and the Dakotas. Government and recreation dependency are also widely distributed, but tend to be more concentrated in the far west as well as in the U.S.-Canada borderlands in the Midwest and Maine. The far hinterland is a sparsely settled expanse of grass and grain lands where oil pipelines cut across the landscape like black scars. It's a fundamentally inconsistent terrain, but also one in which ruined mountain hamlets, desert trailer parks, cookie-cutter cornfields, and bayou, town, bayou towns are united by an uncanny feeling of similarity. There are really only so many ways to kill a place. Aside from the informality and the illegality of their employment profiles and the tendency to rely on productive or extractive industries, they are also united by a certain feeling of slowing time, days, stretched long and empty by unemployment hollowed mills, and factories pieced apart by the concrete wrenching roots of grass and shrubbery. If such a feeling can be given any more analytic definition, it probably lies in the simple fact that much of the far hinterland has a low economic output compared to both the suburban near hinterland and the metropolitan core. This sort of slowness gets to you, seeking into your body and wrapping yourself like molasses around your bones. The longer you stay, the harder it becomes to reach the velocity needed to escape. And then that brings us to a changing of the theme within this chapter. And so let's take a moment to reflect. So what stands out to me from the passage we just read is the outline of the economy that was just given to us by Phil A. Neal. And I think that has been another common theme within this book is the economy of the hinterlands and all the different things that affect and alter the economy of the hinterlands, the people who are able to benefit the most from the economy in the hinterlands. And one of the things he's also done a very good job of doing is explaining to us how much governmental influence is in this economy in these lands and i also found it very interesting for him to break down the black and the gray markets that exist within these hinterlands and that's something that again we've talked about the black markets that exist within urban areas and in, in, in inner cities and how those things contribute to exasperating or how not properly dealing with some of the social issues that exist within urban areas leads to an exasperation of these black market of the black markets that exist there. And the same thing seems to be true here that a, a lack of care being put into the economy of this area or into the le legal economy of this area has went to help to has went or has helped push forward the black market in these areas. Uh, and so I think that's one of the other things that I always try to 
explain to people is that you can't just be bothered by crime or just be bothered by violence or drug usage or shootings or uh, any of these, any things that we deem to be sort of uncivilized or inhumane action. You can't be bothered by that and not be bothered by the things that perpetuate those type of actions or the things that precede those type of actions or precede those type of issues. And before the black market, the drug black market or the gang black market or the violence that exists in this country before it existed at the level it existed now, there were other things that were, that preceded it, that led to us getting here. And until the roots of some of these issues are addressed, until the causes are addressed, you will never be able to get rid of the branches or get rid of the effects. And a lot of politics is about paying attention to the effects uh, paying attention to the branches. I think us naturally as humans, we see the branches and the leaves first. We don't see the roots. The roots are beneath the ground. And it's, uh, it's not really, it's not the first thing that stands out to you. But once it's time to uproot that tree, if you start trying to uproot that tree by tearing down branches and cutting off leaves, you'll see that your work is going to be very much cut out for you. You're going to have to get down into the roots of these things at some point. Uh, and so I think that he does a feel like Neil's doing a good job of showing us the roots of these issues in rural America and in these hinterlands and then showing us the causes and the branches that have grown out from the roots of these issues. And this sentence here, I think, is very true, not only just about the hinterlands, but about urban America as well. This sentence, this sort of slowness gets to you sinking into your body and wrapping yourself like molasses around your bones. The longer you stay, the harder it becomes to reach the velocity needed to escape. It's a very, very enlightening sentence, very impactful, important sentence. That's a, I think that can be, uh, I think that can be pulled out and used for so many, for a variety of things that we've discussed in a variety of circumstances and situations that we've discussed here on the Rock for Reading Daily podcast series. So we are at about 30 minutes, I do believe. So we're going to wrap this episode up. We will be back tomorrow with another episode of Rock for Reading Daily as we continue to read Hinterland. Maybe tomorrow we might get through this last chapter. It might be a longer episode so we can get through the chapter. Maybe not, though. Maybe probably two episodes before we finish the chapter up. Okay, remember we put these episodes out on a daily basis to provide you the opportunity to begin or further your journey in the struggle against police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice. And I'll holler at you tomorrow.